Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to Brain Club. I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns, and I'm the executive director of All Brains Belong. Really glad you're all here. Let me share screen and we'll get started. Okay. So today we'll be having a, what, what, what we think is a really important um, topic on neuroinclusive culture. Um, because that is, after all, what Brain Club is about. Brain Club is our education program that we've been running for um, almost a little bit over two and a half years now for purpose of providing education about All Brains Belong's approach to neuroinclusive community culture, um, specifically educating and modeling what neuroinclusive culture looks like with the idea that then people can go out into their lives and um, contribute to systems change so, so that they, the, uh, the components of neuroinclusive culture can be everywhere. Um, what we intend is that this is a place where everyone can feel safe, a place to experience how culture can be different, a place where we collectively learn and unlearn. And, and what we're going to be talking more about today um, during Brain Club um, is that this is an education program that feels supportive and is a community. And it is different from a support group, different from a place to make individualized requests or individualized sharing. It's a place that really shifts to the collective. Um, Brain Club is about um, honoring the community, the collective growth of learning and unlearning together. And so we invite you to explore today's big picture theme of neuroinclusive culture and share ideas or reflections related to that topic. Um, our community agreement, which is created by our community advisory board that we share at the start of all of our programs, um, is that all paths to participation are okay here. You can have your video on or off. Even if it's on, we don't expect anything of you. Feel free to walk or move or fidget or stim, snack. Um, many people actually find it helpful to have some snacks around or or water or whatever else, um, uh, even as a way of giving space from um, during participation, um, uh, giving 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 your hands something to do. Um, observation is a valid form of participation as well. And in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, as I said before, this is about the collective. And so in order to make this be a safe um, space and, and um, safe experience for all participants, we prioritize the group's collective needs over that of the individual. We think about the group's collective access needs. So access needs being anything that is required for full and meaningful participation. Everyone with all types of brains has access needs. And they're all different types. And so some of the uh, access needs that come up right at the beginning of Brain Club that we like to name um, around communication, giving space for people to enter into the discussion, including in the chat, giving lots of space um, for people to process, so slowing everything down, um, and uh, the technology piece. So uh, closed captioning is enabled. You just have to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. Depending on your version of Zoom, you might see the live transcript closed captioning icon. If not, the more dot 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 and choose show subtitles and or the same to choose hide subtitles if you want to turn them off. And that's my visual support to make sure I have the chat open so I can see it. And I do. Okay, so speaking of the chat, um, during um most of Brain Club today, we're going to watch um, a new video um, of, of uh, actually an impromptu staff meeting yesterday uh, that was exploring this topic that we'll play for you. And while that's going on, you are welcome to ask questions or comment in the chat. We just ask that you use the big chat box and avoid using the reply threads because the reply threads make the chat bounce. Um, and that can be very difficult for our facilitators to keep up. 
um, in the chat. You are welcome to validate other people's comments, um, share your thoughts about how something you're seeing um, resonates with you. You can also ask questions. We ask that you just pause before you use the chat and just be aware of the, um, the, the, the energy and still giving space for other people to be able to participate in the chat. Um, we also have Cadence here. Hi, Cadence. So Cadence is here for tech support. So if you have anything that goes on with technology, we ask that you send a private message to tech support, ABB, to Cadence, who will help you. Um, and uh, just send her a message and she'll she'll do her best to problem solve so that we keep that out of the main chat also as a way of giving space and slowing things down. Okay, so we are beginning our August 2024 theme, learning and unlearning. And we'll kick this off, as I said, with neuroinclusive culture. But first, I want to give a couple of announcements. So one, our third annual community health education fair is coming up in a couple of weeks on Saturday, August 24th. There are two ways to participate. Um, if you're local, we'd love to see you at the Vermont State House lawn from 11 to 3. If you're not local um, or it is more accessible to you to uh, to watch the live stream, that's that's why we have two ways to participate. Um, so if, uh, if, if, oh good, perfect. Lizzie, uh, just put the link in the chat. Um, uh, and that's, that's where you'd get the live stream link also. And there's a preview video and frequently asked questions, all kinds of information about the event. Um, we also would love anyone's help. Um, we, we, uh, this, this event is more than twice as, as, uh, uh, um, robust as last year. Um, so we have all different kinds of roles that we would love, love help with, um, if for, for folks who are local, um, and Sarah put that link to the chat. And last announcement, we have a new resource that launched today, sponsored by the Organization for Autism Research and the Autism Intervention Research for Network on Physical Health. We have our Neuroinclusive Healthcare Education Hub, which is a free education resource for um, uh, clinicians and patients alike, um, really a, a collection of co-created resources. We have our All the Things project in addition to blog posts, webinars, and podcast interviews. Um, there's also infographics and plain language summaries of, of, of all of these things. So uh, we invite you to check it out. And uh, so many, so many of you who are here today helped with this resource. So thank you to all of you. Okay, neuroinclusive culture. You know, people use the term safe space and like, what is even meant by that? And sometimes it gets overused and sometimes places that are called safe space don't feel safe at the level of the nervous system. So an actually safe space, um, it, when we talk about this, is that we come to the space with a shared goal, a shared goal to, act, to, to be in the space together where I'm going to learn about my own access needs and I'm going to learn about yours so that I don't violate them, um, so that we can be in space together. And what, in, what creates neuroinclusive space, we think, are these three things. Number one is having a shared set of expectations. That's why we begin with our community agreement that was co-created um, by our community advisory board. Explicitly normalizing and naming that we all have different brains and we all have different bodies and we all have different ways of experiencing the world and we all have different identities and we and all of this explicitly normalizing diversity. And because um, we all have different brains and different brains have different needs, we are inevitably going to have needs that conflict and having a way to navigate and negotiate that is a key component of neuroinclusive space. Um, so um, protecting access needs. Um, and uh, as you'll hear in this video, um, this idea that um, protecting access needs often runs um, in conflict to the reality that many of us um, have nervous systems that experience negative or even neutral feedback as pain, that term is called rejection sensitive dysphoria. Um, and I think that is just 
how that is and having a way of of naming that and acknowledging that the reality of that because both of both of those things can be true that we need to have a way of giving feedback to protect the collective and um we need to be able to support one another to be in the space um if in fact we have that shared goal to be in the space together energy is everything um so it, the energy that, that that I bring to an interaction and you bring to an interaction, the energy we have together, um, that is part of communication. And you'll hear us um, in this video talk about that. And as I said, a plan for course correction. Because we are going to have conflicting access needs and we are going to um, have, have, have a situation where access needs are not met and we have to rebound from that and reframe and learn about one another so that we can repair communication breakdowns. Um, this graphic came from a brain club we did in October of 2022. We had Hannah Bloom, um, who is our founding board chair and is an occupational therapist. And um, uh, Hannah and I did an interview, and these were some of the themes that came out from that interview um, based on the, the, the frequency with which they came up, this word cloud. So um, connection, access, acceptance, expectations, you've heard about these already, energy, of course. So um, before, before um, we dive into um, our video, I'm going to pass the mic to Sierra. Thank you, Mel. Um, so this video we're going to play is a video recorded. Or, sorry, I'll start. In introduce myself. I'm Sierra. Um, I use share pronouns. Um, and I work here at All Brains Belong. <laughs> um, uh, so this is a video that our staff recorded um, at a staff meeting Re really regarding kind of like what is the essential intent of brain club um and what does it look like to create spaces like that um it's so really focusing on how do you keep the essential 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 intent of an organization and cue safety in large public forums um i was not there yesterday um but my just to add my thoughts on it is I think that one thing that um, Mel and I think a lot of people at ABB model pretty well is transparency and modeling um, your own access needs and asking for your own access needs. And I think that makes it easier to see that no one person's access needs are more important than the whole or the relationship. I think this is talked about in um, relationship-based therapy and that type of stuff of, you know, in a relationship with two people, there's each person and then the relationship is like a third person or a third entity. And I think that um, communities like this are that just on a larger scale. There's each person, there's the interactions between each people. And then there's the, the relationship, the community as a whole, as its separate entity and how to kind of create and control and support that entity as its own thing. Um, anyway, that's my thoughts on it. Um, I will pass it back to you, Mel. Thank you, Sierra. Okay, I'm going to share screen, and uh, this video will run about uh, 34 minutes. Um, uh, it's my first time record. I rec so so literally, we were just having a con. We were like, oh, we're going to make a video for Brain Club, um, and and talk about you know a little intro of like what had to Brain Club get started, and it was going to be really short. And then we got into it and we're like, why don't we just make this Brain Club? And you'll see in the video where we make that decision, and we dive deeper. Um, but on my, on the, on the computer I'm working with, um, it, it, uh, the settings were, um, defaulted to, uh, speaker view. So you can't really tell that there's four of us in a conversation. And in fact, the, 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 what this really looked like, um, was like big, long pauses. Um, and I, it, it, it I, I, I left some of them in, some are so long that I thought what would happen is someone would be like, it's frozen, it's frozen, I don't see anything. And then I'd get dysregulated. So I decided to edit out the pauses. Um, but um, really uh, a conversation of uh, between um, our team here about these issues. And I think you'll see that there are some times that get, that get, um, get a little heated. So uh, here, here we go. Um, oh, sorry, Sierra, hold on. 
Got it. Okay, now I can share screen. With sound. And we'll make it big. What you say is the point of Brain Club? Like we started with a very specific point. But everything we do, we design to be accessible, comfortable, and engaging for people with all different types of brains. So who best benefits from this type of a vaccination clinic? Everyone. We had kids who traveled from all over the state, some on their fourth or even fifth attempt at accessing vaccination. And, and, and while many were able to access vaccination, some were not. And we still wanted to support families in reframing. We can, you know, even if, even if kids are not able to receive vaccination because the limbic system says no, I think it's you know, refra reframing what success is. Yeah. You know, success is not always just getting the vaccine. Success is Wow, you recognized when you didn't feel safe and you honored your internalized signal of threat. Like, isn't that what we want? It's a good thing when people have a positive healthcare experience, like defining like the connection of, you know, I formed some sort of memory that wasn't awful. The more that that pattern goes, right? Those neurons that fire together, the more they do that, the more that pathway, pathway is accessible and has ease. There's no ease in that pathway for a lot of our nervous systems right now because there has been no autonomy, because there's been no agency, there's been no freedom and choice. You know, we realized we had to start talking about these concepts. We had to give people language for their experiences. And that, that was how Brain Club was born. <laughs> so uh, without further ado, let's talk about some lid flipping. You flipped the lid once. Yeah, or, or twice, or, or like twice. a million times. Or 400 million <laughs> or times. A million times. Mm -hmm. Did you know that some people think that they're the only ones who flip their lid? <laughs> Did you know that? No. Oh, no. Some people think they're the only ones, and then they like, they, they, they like, they feel bad about themselves because they think you're the only one. We wanted to give people language to describe their experiences. What we found when we started doing that is that people were like, oh, I have a shared language and other people share my experiences. And I feel a lot less alone now. Um, and there are other people who who have had similar experiences, who think like me, who's experienced the world like me, and there's language to describe what that is like. I think of Brain Club, you know, first and foremost as a space of education. So like you said, the, the intentional place to come and learn, you know, um, a, often a completely new language to reframe our experiences. And so for many people coming to Brain Club, um, you know, words like access needs, um, it's the first time that they've ever thought about something like that. I, I think Brain Club was one of the first places for me where I felt like, wow, I found my people and people who get it. And that is a very new experience for me that I haven't had in my life um, where you're realizing I'm not the only one. Um, this could be, I mean, when I first joined, I was like, this could be a safe space. I don't, I, I've never had that before. I, I don't know exactly what to, what to do with that. You know, because it's so new and exciting and scary at the same time. It's a place to receive an education um, with, with the language that we can use to better understand our brains. But for me, it's definitely a place where I learn um, about my brain and, and how it 
and how and, and in a safe place where everyone else is also learning about their brains. Yeah, thanks for naming the safety piece. Um, I think that we try to create a space that feels safe to everyone, whether they've gotten used to it and they know people and they know what to expect or they're coming for the first time. We want people to feel safe. Like we want people to feel safe all the time, right? Because if you don't feel safe, you don't have access to the education. And it's really hard to cue safety to everyone. And I think that sometimes it gets a little confusing. So um, I think of it as first and foremost, a space of education. Um, I think what's hard is that, like you said, then it becomes a space of connection and safety. And so the lines get a little blurred around what does it mean to be a supportive space that considers the access needs of all the people that are there? And so I think it's hard because what somebody might define as a support group, somebody else might have a different definition of that. Um, a lot of what we call safe spaces, you know, you raise your hand if you want to share something or you, you know, you, you you go around the room and everybody gets to share something. But when you're in a space like this, you're not always sure what somebody's going to share and what safety is for one person may be very different for somebody else. So it's like, how do you create that safe space where, you know, people can share what's on their mind, but also know that, you know, it's um, it may not be safe for somebody else to hear it or receive right. it, right? right? Because I think that especially because so many of us have never had the space to express in a free way. Um, and sometimes it's even hard when you are dysregulated or deep in burnout or tired, it's hard to even self monitor about like, the impact of your communication on other people. Um, what I mean by that is, you know, communication is, it's, it's, it's many things. It is words, whether mouth words or in the chat. It's also nonverbal. It's the energy behind the words if words are shared. Um, and I think that there are many participants in our community who are porous to energy, taking in all the energy of other people or having energy drained by sometimes some of the things that are shared. Does anyone have any thoughts about that? It's the hard part. It's it's us working to try and be clear on what we're what the goals are with Brain Club and and Brain Club being a space of education and not in a support group, you know, what does that mean? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Um, so it's it's a supportive education space. It is not a place to vent. It is not a place to process trauma. It is not a place to solicit or problem solve or anything individually. It's a group experience where you are part of community learning and unlearning. And and I I really enjoy that i mean i'm not the best at group spaces it can be hard for me to like jump in like my whole life um so i love that we have the multiple ways of interacting at brain club i've never seen it done before in a group where um you can also communicate via the chat or use mouth words for me it's easier for me to jump in um on the chat to share and um, and to learn. And um, another thing I also like about Brain Club is that we try to incorporate processing time and um, in the chat and with mouth words. And I've never seen that done before in other spaces and groups. Thank you for naming that, right? So slowing down, giving space, even in the chat, sometimes people are not able to join in or share or comment if they see someone typing a lot or still like just 
typing, typing, right? So it's just as you would pause with mouth words, um, when you've shared, you pause, you've said your piece and you step back for other people to have a chance. Um, the same thing goes in the chat. And that's hard sometimes because when you've got foot on the gas and you're dysregulated and you're kind of stuck on something, it makes it hard to even know that that's what's happening. And without realizing it, that impacts other people. So I think that one of the, you know, when we talk about the the, the principles of neuroinclusive culture, right? Because Brain Club is about educating about and modeling neuroinclusive culture. And so we normalize that we all have different brains and different brains have different needs. We normalize that that what, what, the, what follows from that is that we're going to have conflicting needs and we're going to have to work through that. And then I think the, you know, the, the, the other piece of that is that there is this awareness of one's own energy state, right? So communication is exchange, exchange of words, mouth words, chat words, and of energy. So I think that part of neuroinclusive culture involves pausing and taking taking a sense of, of, of taking stock of one's internal state before communicating. Because um, yes, everyone is welcome here. And um, part of a neuroinclusive space is one in which we are paying attention to the people around us, not because anyone's needs matter more than anyone else's, but because that's what being in a community is. You know, I also think about the um, the the excitement of being in a space that's like for the first time where you're, you know, you're with like-minded folks and the excitement of wanting to interact can also, it's hard to, you know, pull back in create space when you're really happy and excited to be in this space, right? Right. And that um, excitement is also energy, right? right? We're just balancing, you know, how, how, what is my energy and how is that impacting my exchange um verbal or nonverbal with other people in community it's hard to take stock of your energy and be self-aware and self-monitor those are like complex executive functioning skills and so when we part of neuroinclusive culture is such that when we don't have access to those parts of our brain to self-monitor and take stock of how you know I am exchanging with others, with mouth words, with chat words, with energy. Um, that might be a really important time to step back and listen and observe and 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 learn um, from other people. That might be what participation needs to look like at those times. And. Um, Neuroinclusive culture is hard to implement. Um, I think that in our uh, medical programs where we have longstanding relationships, um, that is much easier to do than interfacing with the general public, um, especially when it's it's different people every time and there's people who come and people who go and um, people who are checking it out and they've never experienced this culture. Um, they also might just not they might decide that they don't like this culture they might not like having the responsibility to self-monitor one's exchange with others that might be just not what someone has capacity for um in which case observation in and it, it is a valid form of participation but they also might not like it or want it and that's okay also might have no idea what it feels like to do that yeah or what that looks like or right. feels and like Right. And if you um, are not pausing, if you haven't been, if you haven't had exposure to the skill of pausing to take stock of one's internal state before communicating with math words, within the chat, with energy, um, that is not something that's intuitive. 
And you, if you're not pausing, observing, stepping back, watching, listening, if you're not doing that, you also can't learn from brain club. So we're trying to model how you do that. I think a barrier for me to groups is using mouth words, like knowing when to like come into the conversation and share or um, like not wanting to step on other people's voices or um, or or when they're sharing and stuff and just being really confused about all that. But the chat like opens up that door for me to share and and feel like I can be a part of the group and feel like I can belong in a in in a safe way for me. Impulse control is really hard for me. It's hard for me to stop talking a lot, but the mute button is an amazing accommodation. When the mute button is on, I cannot be interrupting. I cannot be talking over. I cannot be like bringing my mouth words and my energy through my mouth words. I like it's it's a it's a pause button. The chat doesn't have a mute button. So the chat is actually, I think, harder sometimes when you are dysregulated, when you have foot on the gas, when you have lost the ability to self-monitor, then it is even more important to figure out how you're going to build in your pause button. Um, for me, sometimes that is closing the chat. Yeah, um, and I think it's we... hard with it. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no go, ahead. go ahead. I thought you were done. I think um, also just like if you have slower processing speed, the chat can be really challenging. Like I know that I struggle with that. Like the chat sometimes goes so fast for me to keep up with it is really challenging. So that yeah. I guess is an access need that I've discovered. Yep. And we have like figured out like the, you know, the workarounds, like, you know, not the, it, it's in addition to stopping the bouncing visually by using the big box instead of the reply threads, it's still the pace. But what do you do? What do you do when someone comes in for the first time? I'm actually thinking that I think we like don't play the video we were planning to play and we just make this be brain club. What do other people think about this? I was actually thinking, like, as you were talking, I was thinking about this would be a really good brain club. That's I think I we just make too. this brain club, yeah. right? Yeah, we were planning. I mean, to learning this. how to communicate in this way is a skill that is not not a lot of people have this, and it takes a lot of time to learn this skill of listening and how to interact in a way that you may never have done before. I just like if it feels very new. I'm thinking about it as somebody who's never experienced it before or been in a space where they felt like they could share what's on their mind and be, in, you know, in a in a way that's received well. Yeah. Right. And, you know, how do we like reframe, you know, a lot of people are trying to unlearn like people pleasing and like having people like you, but like when you come to a space where the purpose of the gathering is to exchange ideas, what kind of things do you set up for yourself? Like, how do you reflect on your own access needs? Like Sarah saying, you know, I didn't actually know that I have an access need for processing, but then I see the chat exploding my brain and like, oh, guess what? I learned. But I, I think that um, Brain Club is our community education space. So when we decide to step into that, um, it's important to remember that we're going to be stepping into a place where we're all connected together. So part of neuro-inclusive culture is like coming to an education space with a community agreement that says I step into this space and I exchange ideas my communication is I don't want to say like limited to the exchange of ideas but like limited is kind of the word that comes to mind like there has to be like how do you I mean yeah like impulse control is hard it's 
a brain thing, right? So mute button, but we have to kind of, if, if I have an access need for the mute button, which I do, I have to, when I have access to my cortex, now that this is becoming brain club, I think I can rabbit hole a little in tunnels, um, but like part of, part of um, being in community, being in relationship with other people, exchanging ideas involves when I have access to my cortex to like do some thinking, not at brain club at some other time, maybe like, what am I going to put in place to meet my own access needs? So if I have an access need for the equivalent of the mute button in the chat, I got to figure that out. Maybe I'm going to have a fidget. Maybe I'm going to be eating dinner during brain club. My hands are busy, so I'm not typing. Something that is going to allow me to access the content without infringing upon others' access needs by using the chat in such a way that it does not allow other people to enter the conversation. And it's less of a place where we have disconnected power and um and yeah i think of times in my life where i've seen disconnected power where it's like powering over and i know mel has talked about the my little pony episodes where they have the power of connection and i always remember that <laughs> yeah totally like part of dismantling broken systems is acknowledging energy and power that's part of neuroinclusive culture and if we're not thinking about energy and power we often miss a lot of the sometimes subtle and really important aspects of communication. So which is why a lot of times when people are new to Brain Club, they, they, they don't communicate. When people, so a lot of times when people are new to Brain Club, they start out in an observational role. They take a few weeks or a few months to get the lay of the land to really immerse themselves in trying out this new culture. They observe, they watch, um, they maybe read the chat if they want to, um, but they take time to first observe and learn a culture that is new and different from what one might have experienced before. One of the things that I think we see in our medical practice when we have like longstanding, more longstanding relationships, not just us and our patients, but our patients with each other, um, is that people eventually reach a place where they can give and receive feedback feedback is hard in neuroinclusive culture because so many of us experience rejection sensitive dysphoria when someone gives us feedback that is negative or even neutral um that is experienced by many nervous systems as pain literal pain um how do, I don't know, how do we do that at our work team? Like we give each other feedback. How do we pull it off? I think for me, um, getting the feedback from our work team, I know we have the underlying culture of interdependence. And so I think that helps shift my mind into thinking that um, we're all going to be here for each other and um, 
yeah, I think just having, it's kind of like having like a safety net in my brain. I think that helps me. Yeah, I agree. I agree with Lizzie. It's, um, it's like an automatic safe uh, safety that I, uh, that I know that whatever the feedback is, or uh, it's going to be, it's, it's done in a, in a way that's not, it's only to improve. It's not to shame or make us feel less than, or yeah. Right. So I think that's, that comes down to energy. Like if I am giving any of you feedback, I like deeply at like a, like a deep level have unconditional positive regard for all of you. Like I adore all of you. And I would like to think that my communication incorporates that energy. I don't know if my communication incorporates that energy, but like I, I'd, I'd like to think that it has that there's a difference between my interaction with someone for whom I do not have unconditional positive regard for. I and think you don't get to part pick. of. I think part of it is proactively talking about access needs as a staff. Like, you know, how do you best receive information? How do you best communicate your own information? Like. I think part of it is that part of it is like retroactively each month, looking back at the month and saying like, what worked, what didn't work. And I think those conversations naturally lead towards like unpacking anything that didn't work, um, but not in a confrontational way, just like, here's what didn't work. Um, and I would agree that like, there's a deep level of, of respect and trust with an interdependent team that, um, we care about each other and that we don't get it right all the time and that's human that's being human like we can expect that we won't get it right all the time and so the goal is then to have that trust and connection so that we can fall on that and um talk about it and have dialogue with each other about what what happened so that we can learn from it i i think with the um with the connection that we have and the connection that we've built within our team. Um, I think that that also helps us keep in all of our minds that we may have fluctuating capacities and we may need to pivot here or there. Um, but I think the underlying foundation of connection allows us um, to shift when we need to. Um, and look back at things um, that might need to shift or change and also look forward to um, new systems that we want to build too. Totally. But like where, as it relates to like the general public at Brain Club, stepping into this space, like we didn't know each other, like none of like, like we didn't, we didn't have a pre-existing group that knew each other right so i think it has to start somewhere and i think it has to start from a perspective of it's basically like part of being in a neuroinclusive space is that i have to be thinking about other people i have to be like that's what it is isn't it like like that's what's different i show up and i am thinking about other people and everyone else is thinking about other people and if I don't have capacity to think about other people, that's a day I'm going to step back and watch and listen. Because, like, I think one of the things that I really struggle with is, I don't know, is it, like, is it the case that when we say all brains belong, what goes with that is all brains belong who intend to be part of a community and part of being in a community means i don't know like 
like that's got to be part of it you can't just like show up and like power over everyone you can't you can't power over other people in neuroinclusive culture it really that's what it comes down to I might edit that out. But I think it's important. Is there it's energy? important? Yeah, I think it's important to say. I think it's kind of like like there are some there world rules. Be, there are some world world rules and they exist to keep things in order. There's I have an access need for like non-chaos. And so the way I try to meet that access need is I work really hard to like build the container. And when the container spills over or the container explodes i'm pretty dysregulated by that and i'm i think being transparent about that is important like we have a program that has some norms community agreement it's what the people are expecting when they come each week and if we are not delivering that i feel like a moral imperative to like do something about it we have to follow the traffic lights like on the road like there are things that exist for a reason and and so i get where you're coming from you're trying to tap into that i'm not sure how to say it the worst thing that could happen in my view at brain club is for someone to feel unsafe and if i can't create a space that feels safe for everyone to participate in their own way. I feel a moral imperative to make changes to the structure of Brain Club. What we want is for people to show up authentically, um, exchange in ideas, whether that be directly or indirectly, um, having the intention of learning from other people. And with those ground rules of, I'm gonna learn about my own access needs and I'm gonna learn how to not infringe upon yours. Like, so when we say participate in your own way, it's within that structure and being really explicit about those ground rules. That is part of neuro-inclusive culture. I think the setup too, like I've never seen anything like Brain Club, the setup where you can come and just come with your video off, type in the chat, use mouth words like I think that really for me that creates a lot of safety and like I never knew that I actually liked typing in the chat more than using mouth words like that's something new that I learned about my brain and structuring of the container not in a rigid way but in a cultural norms way of how are we going to be in space together how are we going to hold the space together how are we going to support one another how are we going to seek to understand one another that's what this is about i'm thinking that there are a few different um things that you could do if if you think you might need to have a little take a step back or um take a little pause from brain club and i know we've talked about minimizing the chat before or um turning down the volume if you need to take a little break creating space for other people what that what that can look like is if i am a person who um you know i'm the first one to have my hand up and i put my hand up multiple times like maybe i'm going to step back or if i'm someone who shares a lot in the chat maybe i'm going to do an experiment where just today i'm going to try to you know not do that and see what happens does that actually create space for other people to show up in a way that they weren't able to access the exchange before. Um, I don't know if there are other ways. Maybe going to grab a glass of water or a snack. Oh, you muted Mel. Yeah. Yeah, like physically leaving the room. Like I got foot on the gas. 
I can't stop talking. I can't stop typing. I can't stop venting. I can't stop whatever. Maybe I need to like get up and move my body. Get a drink of water. Like you're saying, like physically leaving the space. I think it's not just a brain club. It's like in life when I can catch myself with foot on the gas inertia. It's like part of the way I'm wired. I, I tend toward foot on the gas um, or foot on the brake. Either way, that's like what happens when you're dopamine deficient, when you are you know, you have an autistic ADHD brain, that's what happens, right? So you got foot on the gas and you can start catching that. Well, then you got to drive your car somewhere else. Like, go get that snack. Go get that glass of water. Otherwise, that completely understandable state that's like part of my nervous system, it does impact my ability in the moment to have exchange, multi-way exchange of ideas. Like including now, I would like to stop talking. I remember once we had a panelist who said, when I attend Brain Club, I don't feel drained. I have more energy than when I arrived. And that was so deeply meaningful to me. And so it's really it's really important to me that that is people's experience, that it is not, oh, man, I'm so tired. I just went to brain club. I'm exhausted. All right. Like, that's not safe. It was, it's not about censorship. It's not about rejection. It's really about maintaining the purpose of brain club, which is about providing education about and modeling neural inclusive culture. I think our um, one of our hopes at Brain Club too in modeling neural inclusive culture would be that when when our um, time is finished each week that that we could all maybe go away with the sense that energetically That was a really neat educational experience. Well, thank you for um, being part of our extended team here and watching that. Um, Sarah. Um, I was going to comment on what Sarah, the other Sarah here tonight was saying in the chat about family and whether it's difficult to take this kind of language and this experience to perhaps your family or other environments. And I think it is, but I think that coming to brain club and learning about access needs and practicing, you know, having this conversation around people who get it hopefully gives you the tools in your toolkit to kind of have that frame of reference so that when you are going into maybe more neuronormative environments, um, you have that narrative and can um, fall back on that, you know, to communicate what you need in, in a space. Thanks, Sarah. Amy. Hey, I just wanted to hop on. I feel like, um, you know, All Brains Belong for me has, you know, I think we've all heard this on the videos a million times, but um, it's just given me a space to belong. I'm often quiet on here. I might have things to say, but I feel like it's a space where I could say something um, and it feels like it would be honored. And I feel like I've learned so much from the community of <clears throat> just, I think in a way, like so many of us have like lived and tried to survive a normative culture. And it's just been so stressful for our systems and we haven't necessarily gotten it. So I can see how, if we come to a space that says all brains belong, we can be, we can fidget, we can stim, we can eat. It can be confusing um, for folks who are like, oh, finally, I can breathe, I can be here and be myself. And I, and so what I want to say is like, what I've learned through my experience of All Brains Belong is 
if we take the approach of learning from one another and to honor ourselves as well as other people to know that no one here would ever want to give anyone else a shaming experience. I just know that because I know how hard I'm on the community advisory committee. You know, I've been a part of like a lot of the medical, you know, culture here. And I just know how hard the staff works, the community works to make sure that no one feels shame in giving feedback and that we would never want anyone to walk around, walk away from the experience here saying, I'm not enough, I'm not good enough. And that really what everybody is saying tonight, I think in the culture is that in order to keep this safe, that the staff at ABV has needed to adjust and accommodate certain situations. And that maybe has watered down the content and the conversation that could be happening. And that I feel like uh, I wouldn't want anyone to walk away tonight to feel like, well, I was a problem. I can't go back. That it's really more about feedback that maybe that people haven't been able to say on the chat or haven't been able to say with mouth words that they're the pace or the way things are happening makes them not have access. And so people might not be understanding there's behind the scenes ha things that happen. There's impact to people that may not actually have the ability to, to communicate in the group, but doesn't mean that they're not doing that other places. And so I just really encourage everyone just to take into their heart the the hearts of ABB and the staffing of how much effort that they have put in to making this a space for all of us and that this is a free program like we're not even being charged to be here and that you know it's just been just a, such a wonderful community uh, for me to be a part of I'm here every, almost every week that I can be here uh, I don't often speak in the, the this larger group, um, but I I am here and I am participating and I get to and I can have my screen off and I can be eating eggs and I can like not chat and I can just be here and that matters. That really matters. Uh, so anyway, that's I'll get off my soapbox. Thank you, Amy. I really appreciate that. I really appreciate you saying all that. Thank you. Thank you. Right. And I think it, it really is about um, I think like you heard a theme you probably heard a lot tonight is the idea of how does my participation impact the participation of others? Um, and I think that that lens, I think, is is the essence here. So thanks for naming that. Michelle and then Sierra, and then we're going to wrap up. Thank you. Um, gosh, I had like five different thoughts and now I've got stage fright. Um, <laughs> um, I lose sight of that last thing you said, how it was my participation affect others. And um, I feel like I've been like, like I used to be a very shy person and, and like in early elementary school and stuff. And I actually had to stay back in third grade. And um, so like ever since then, I've, I've had to like really push myself to get the grades and the grades always counted on whether or not you participated in class, even, you know, even in, in elementary school, like, you know, so it's like, I'd make myself, you know, do it. And until I got to the point where it's not that I'm not afraid of it, I still feel the fear, but it's just, you just, you just get used to feeling the fear and you do it. But also um, one of the other last things that Amy was saying about don't ever want to make anyone feel shamed, but we can just feel shame just by speaking up because you know, especially if you're, you're, you're like a really introverted person, it's just shameful just speaking up, you know? So even if you didn't put your foot in your mouth or whatever, that's just a shameful experience. And, 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 um, you know, it's like, you, you kind of like need to have some kind of acknowledgement that you, you have spoken up. And another thing I wanted to say was that this is like very timely because we just had a conversation. We had a training. Um, I'm on the Connecticut Council of Developmental Disabilities and we have the National Leadership consortium on developmental disabilities that are giving us a training on how to make safe spaces and we actually yesterday's um or was it two days ago we were talking about shared agreements we had to come up with our shared agreements and i wasn't able to articulate what i meant but everything i'm hearing tonight is exactly what i was thinking and couldn't put it in words so i kind of wish i had this meeting first and <laughs> well, but mel they up. will be <laughs> they are con gonna contact you because i gave them your name because they do want to contact someone who could help them make more 
you know, neuro-inclusive spaces. So they will be contacting you. So please That's don't awesome. ignore that. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sierra, and then we're going to wrap up. Um, I just wanted to share, or I guess verbally share something. Um, uh, I think Chris put in the chat about how Brain Club is a place that's used as a medium for ideas rather than a personal support group. And that means it can be open to a wider, um, different types of neurotypes. And I just, I think that's, um, I think that's really important and really a really great way to talk about how when you, when you create it as a shared space, as a medium to share ideas, you get to invite people that are more different than you um, into a space that's safe um, for every specific type of neurotype. Um, and I'm just really thankful to have that type of, that type of space. because that's a really cool thing to be able to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for, for naming that. Thank you, Sierra, for, for bringing that, um, shining, shining a, a spotlight on that, on that comment, right? It's the idea of coming to learn from other people. And I think that support groups are really important. Um, and I think that learning to, um, um, not just learning to tell your story is an important experience. It's an important skill. It's an important, um, thing to happen in a safe space. Um, this just isn't that type of group. And I think that, um, what, what, what that's about is, you know, we're, we're, we're not, uh, trained facilitators for that kind of work. And so it would not be responsible of all brains belong to have, um, you know, a, a, a space where folks are sharing traumatic stories and people are processing trauma and then like they leave and they don't have follow-up support. Um, and, and that would be worse than, than that. So I, 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 I think I, that's the a point I wanted to name that, um, education about neuroinclusive culture and modeling what some of the some of the ways in which that can look um in a public program that that is where we have uh carved out a space to work on and i think that um neuroinclusive support groups are really important um and uh this just isn't one of them so i uh i i absolutely appreciate ap appreciate that distinction um, and, uh, I, I, uh, I, 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 I feel like I want to, I want to name one more, one, one more point in the, from the chat that's coming up about value. And I think that when we grow up in a society that t gives us the message that, you know, there's one right way to do the thing. And this is what a quote, normal person looks like and sounds like and communicates and thinks and plays and all of that that takes its toll. Um, and, you know, part of dismantling all of the oppressive systems, ableism, racism, you know, all of the isms, right, is, is, it's just sort of acknowledging that we do have these narratives that came from somewhere, they just happen to be wrong. So the idea <laughs> is, that um, you know, you have value because you show up. You have value because you you are that you you just you know you're a person in this space, and you have value for that reason and that reason alone. It's not about what you produce, and it's not about what you say, and it's not about you know whatever how many times you raise your hand in a meeting. It's about I just I'm here. I'm me. And I'm going to be around other people where I can be with. It's the idea of being, that the act of being um, is like, it's its own thing. And you don't have to do anything else. Um, so so uh, with, with that, thank you. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. And uh, we look forward to continuing uh, our journey of, of learning and unlearning together. Um, next week, we'll be uh, breaking down um, the myth of independence. Um, that is, uh, independence is a myth, and it is um, it's about autonomy with interdependence, and that, that's that's what we'll be taking a look at next week. Thanks, everybody. Bye.